<laughs> How you doing? <laughs> See, I didn't, I didn't get a hat. Uh, uh, my friend told me to get a hat for the for the brainstorm podcast, but no, no. Is it cool? Not shiny enough. I I I like you with a hat or without a hat. Without a hat, okay. <laughs> if you say so, <laughs> I think that's nonsense. All right, so uh, uh, let's get started. I'm gonna show you something and, and tell me if you like it. Okay, ready? Here we go. So, so you did you like that new 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 opening? Uh, two comments. <laughs> okay. Uh, why aren't why isn't your name the same size as mine? Because you are sort of like the guest. Ho I'm just the host. But no, like no, the no, 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 no. <laughs> so that you need to change the fonts there. You want to change them all. And uh, I, I like the electrical kind of zipping. You could hear noise, that, right? Yeah, the, like action, the, the, action, the action potential is firing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this, is that what you call it? The action potential? Yes, yes. Like in my head, I thought it was synapses. You know, that's what I... I well, would the think. synapses are the areas where two nerves come together. Come but together, the right? electrical <laughs> conduction... The signal conduction down the nerve, that's the action potential. That's the action. Okay, okay, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Ryan O'Neill Williams. And as usual, my co host and super guest is Dr. Simon Missios, neurosurgeon, MD, F A A N S. Uh, <laughs> Doc, you want to tell them, you want to, you want to tell them why you're here, what we're doing this. So we are here with Ryan to talk about neuroscience. That's right. That's right. And this month, as it turns out, is brain injury. Um, March is brain injury month. And uh, so we were, we were going to talk about some brain injury, a.k.a. traumatic brain injury, right? It's not just just known as injured brain injuries, correct? Yeah. Uh, so brain injury awareness month, uh, mm -hmm. a, a very, very common event that most people don't think about mm -hmm. uh, but we see it on a daily basis uh, yeah. it's very easy to to hit your head and yeah. the, and its contents yeah 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 they were saying um that that uh, I've, I've been reading a couple of articles uh, i mean honestly this has been on my mind for a while because in the last month or so we had this situation with uh uh, actor Bob, Bob Saget. And as you can see here, the deadline article, uh, Bob Saget causes of death is revealed accidental after unwitnessed fall. So he went to bed. He apparently fell down, hit his head. He said he wasn't feeling well, right? And they're saying that he fell down, hit his head. They don't know what happened. He went to bed and just never woke back up. Is that common, Doc? Have you, have you heard of that a lot? I mean... Does that make sense? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, it, 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 these thing, these events gain a lot of popularity when it's a famous person, right? Who who sustains this? But uh, yeah, unfortunately, it happens. The most people who fall and hit their head, you know, it can happen. It can happen very frequently to elderly patients, right? Uh, because they, you know, as we get older, we get weaker, we get out of balance. Uh, also, as we get older, a lot of times people uh, start taking blood thinners for cardiac conditions or for because they've had a previous stroke, for example. So if you fall and hit your head, you're more likely to bleed. Um, but again, but young people too. Young people do yeah. a lot of, you know, crazy, stupid things, uh, very more dangerous activities, yes. more physical activities. Right. So again, that exposes you to to injury. Yeah. Um, but if you had to say what exactly happened, you don't know because you're not the medical examiner on this, and or you are not Doctor uh, Bob Saget's doctor. You know, just the disclaimer, yeah, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Yeah. But um, if you had to say what what do you think happened here, he hit his head. He probably wasn't bleeding on on because he he, he went to bed with it. But mm -hmm. what do you think probably happened? 
So when you when you have a closed head injury, as we or a traumatic brain injury, uh, you have a lot of force that uh, is applied on the skull, and the skull can absorb a lot of force. Okay. But a lot of times that force gets uh, can break the skull, so you can have a skull fracture, mm -hmm. or it can gets transmitted to what's inside the skull, which is the brain. The brain floats in spinal fluid, yeah, and that helps cushion it and absorb some of the impact. Mm -hmm. But depending on the amount of force, the brain gets essentially rattled. It can, yeah. uh, it can move within the skull. It can uh, bounce within the skull and hit the side of the skull, and you can get bruises on the surface of the brain. We call these contusions. Um, which There's is also what happens with football players, they're saying now, and what probably always happens with boxers, yes? Yeah, so you have injury that you can see and injury mm -hmm. that you cannot see. Right. Uh, so on a microscopic level, the it, it is impossible to assess the full extent of the injury. Right. So there's a way to classify the different types of head trauma. So if someone hits their head and they act goofy for a period of time, we, but their imaging doesn't show any bleeding in the brain, we call that a concussion. Yeah. Uh, we Certainly some injury has taken place because yep. it has caused them to have some deficits for a period of time. But the brain is able to recover from that. Um, and, and the injury, the extent of the injury is not enough that we can see on a head CT or an MRI. Right. right. If the force is more than that, then we start seeing findings on imaging. And those right. can range from a skull fracture to a brain bruise, a contusion, or to bleeding that comes from blood vessels not inside the brain, but around the brain. Right. And that can lead to something called an epidural hematoma or a subdural hematoma, uh, depending on whether the blood is above or below the lining of the brain. Um, in the case of Bob Sackett, again, I'm not the medical examiner. It's hard to know what happened. Right. But you can think of uh, him hitting his head developing a small hemorrhage uh, or passing out and then you know over the course of a few hours that bleed got worse and as as the the blood forms a collection it's got nowhere to go yeah. and it starts eventually starts pushing on the brain causing pressure in the brain and that makes people even sleepier and so if there's no one around them who can ask for help, sometimes right. it's very difficult for them to do that. Right, right, right. And I mean, he, he basically said to you, you know what, I'll probably just go to sleep. I'll feel better in the morning and went to sleep. And the next thing you know, he, he, you know, he's, uh, he's there. So you, you're, you were saying that a lot of young people uh, happens a lot for young people because they, you, you know, they do all these other interesting things or sometimes dangerous things because, you know, young people always think that, no, I'm, I'm going to live forever, whatever. And literally, they're saying that Alaska, in um, Alaska's news source, uh, dot com, they're saying Alaska leads the nation in traumatic brain injury related deaths, specifically because a lot of them are you use off road vehicles on a regular basis because mm -hmm. they don't have as many roads, I guess, up there. Alaska is this giant tundra of a place. And uh, of course, there are lots of car accidents because the roads are icy and that sort of thing. So do you see a lot of uh, people coming in with car accidents? Is that the kind of the thing that you generally see or hear about? Uh, when it comes to younger people, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, alcohol is a, plays a huge role here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if the same thing applies for the, uh, for the information you presented on Alaska. Uh, but yeah, uh, car accidents, mm -hmm. uh, motorcycle accidents, uh, that's typically the most common 
event in traumatic uh, that, that leads to a traumatic brain injury in young people um depending on the geography like if you're a, in an area that has a lot of skiing resorts so you know skiing totally makes sense uh snow snow snowmobiling snowboarding i mean totally again those sense. those are activities as well yeah um in general most of the people you see with a traumatic brain injury tend to be older patients and and those involve just a simple fall, fall. From, while walking or standing or trying to get around the house um yeah. but when it comes to a younger pace and you know also like if it's a warmer climate you know swimming pool people dive into a shallow swimming pool you see that boating accidents so yeah, 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 I've got a physical therapist friend who's uh, his, his his whole thing is how do I stop falls? Like he he every time he goes to see people, he says a lot of older people are just falling. They fall a lot for different reasons. You know, they're just mm -hmm. not steady on their feet as they used to be, and when they fall, it's almost always very very. And if they fall one time, two times, by the third time, it's over. And so. He's like, you know, how can we make it so they don't fall as much or they are more, they pay more attention to the fact that they're falling. I mean, in fact, you know, they're kind of saying it, that in Congress that it's, they're trying to say in Congress, here's a, uh, uh, an article from The Hill where they're trying to say uh, it's time that we take brain injury epidemic seriously do you do you consider it an epidemic you think it's happening so many times that we should consider it some sort of emergency and take care of that well i don't know how you would yeah. um, i mean it's been happening throughout the course of history right um there's ancient skulls that are discovered that show signs of head injury oh, wow. i mean back in the day it was typically the sign of uh, the result of uh, conflict, military conflict, war, yeah, yeah, look, um, battlefields, local athletic fields, uh, the epidemic. Uh, yeah, you're right. How do you stop it from happening? I mean, the whole point why we have these these thick heads is for that, right? It's, it's interesting that you would want to stop it, but are we not being safe? Are we doing dumb stuff? more than we used to well, what what, what, are, what does the article say like what, what are they proposing the uh, this whole thing he's like each year they go up each year in the u.s traumatic brain in, in, injury uh tbi results in the project 2.8 million emergency department visits hospitalizations or death and they're like while we typically think of athletes in tbi brain injury can impact people at all ages and walks of life and they're saying that they would like to grasp the seriousness of Congress, to grasp the seriousness of brain injury. They want more law to comprehend the true extent of this and work towards solutions. They're not even saying they have one. They're just saying we should definitely work towards one. While we know, I'm oh, sorry, while we know a brain injury, here we go. While we know that brain injury is the leading cause of death and disability in our country, the exact numbers are unknown. It's imperative Congress both support the CDC's efforts to better understand the full impact. So they don't even really un understand the impact. Part of it, Doc, is I have a friend, for example, who um, she had a brain injury and didn't, she was in a car accident and didn't even realize that she had it until, I mean, like a day maybe a month later where she couldn't do some of the things that she used to do it didn't happen right away it was maybe a week or or two i think it was a month where she just couldn't remember certain things she is um she was a baker she's mm -hmm. a baker and she had to relearn a lot of things you know what one day i might actually ask her to come be a guest on the show and talk about but she had she did all this stuff and relearned a lot of stuff and she would tell us about it every day on Facebook because one she said writing it makes her feel you know better but also you know she wanted to track her progress so sometimes it can be a delayed effect from a, a, a traumatic in brain injury uh sure the I just don't know I mean, the, the traumatic brain injury is, is just so unpredictable. 
uh, just because every trauma is unique right. how you hit your head is a unique event it, it takes a few seconds but how the force gets transmitted throughout the brain mm -hmm. you know is rather chaotic you know, and, it, and it varies from person to person uh and it also like how its brain responds to traumatic brain injury is also a very unique situation mm -hmm. so um i just don't see how you'd be able to how the government would be able to you know of stop control, an epidemic control, right control like control this i mean the, the use of seat belts making seat belts mandatory prevent thousands probably yeah. millions of yeah, yeah. brain injuries every year but do, uh, you uh, and i don't know this because that happened in the 70s i mean we didn't really realize it because we were we were probably kids but i was looking at some information about that and how when that came into being people fought that tooth and nail man they did not want to have to put seat belts on or put them in they just did i mean now we take it for granted that everybody should put yeah. on seat belts and you should put your kids in in car seats and whatever but back in the 70s i remember getting into a car and just bouncing around for whatever reason i mean just the way that they were built it's it's probably similar with the helmets uh, yeah. and motorcycles and, yeah. and there's still a few states that have no helmet laws right uh, most states have helmet laws but mm -hmm. but i'm sure those those help too i mean in my experience i know when a motorcyclist has a has an accident it makes a huge difference to whether they live or die if they have a helmet on right 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 uh, oh so they come to you and you're like okay Definitely his brain got bounced around, but he, his skull isn't cracked open, right? Uh, well, also the helmet prevents your brain well, from being bounced right. around. Oh, yeah. okay. oh, from a little bit. Oh, that too. Of course. Okay. okay, okay. In my head, I just thought that, yeah, if you're... Because it, it absorbs the impact. Yeah, it's more of the impact. Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. So, okay. So, I mean, part of what we were talking about is definitely, you know, for this, this gentleman had an injury, but as it turned out, you know, and you pointed out to me when we pull, I pulled this article that this is not exactly an injury. He is in this thing because it's Lou Gehrig's disease. I didn't know Lou Gehrig's disease completely made your brain. What is it called? Tr locked in syndrome. Like he couldn't talk with his family. Well, let's 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 talk about this for a little bit so okay. we don't confuse the audience. Right, because so, this is definitely not an injury thing, right? So t tell tell me I, uh, how and why you picked. Well, I came to this article because I was making the move from the 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 injuries and how the injuries are here, I, and we're using them, but then. How can we assist people who have had the different injuries and movement? And I saw this article about this guy who was tra basically trapped in his brain. Is it possible to have a brain injury that does this, that completely makes it so that your brain does not connect with the rest of your body? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, there are conditions that can lead to this state and um, there is the term called locked in syndrome which means that your brain uh, functions but your body doesn't yeah. uh, means that there's a disconnect between the brain and the spinal cord okay so typically that involves conditions that affect the, the connection is the brainstem because right. normally the signals they will uh, originate in the brain mm -hmm. and then they will go through the, the thalamus down to the brainstem and then to the spinal cord and then through the nerves to your extremities your arms your legs and the rest right. of your body okay, cool. uh if there is a, a disconnect at the level of the brainstem then the signal cannot get down to the spinal cord so essentially your brain may be functioning but you're not able to um to move your arms your legs uh, sometimes you're not able to breathe on your own etc so it's a, it's a horrible horrible situation right so uh, 
thankfully there's not a lot of conditions that can do that um a stroke a certain type of stroke can do that right uh, a high cervical spinal cord injury can do that uh, this specific gentleman has uh, a condition called ALS right and that is a, a neurodegenerative condition uh, that involves the destruction of the motor neurons okay. so of the spinal cord so essentially uh, the nerves that control movement at the level of the spinal cord they start dying and we don't know why right and there's no because we there's don't know no why cure. yeah there's no cure for this right right right, right. and it's uh it becomes worse and worse and worse to the point where you're not able to move your arms or legs right to the point where you're not able to breathe on your own right because um, your brain still controls all of that stuff regardless even though it may be in the back of your, your medulla oblongata right i remember that that from biology right the, the, the part right of- but 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 the brain the the cortex the surface of the brain is still functioning right um and this uh i don't know if you want to talk further about the article or no it, it, it basically i mean if this is not the same thing as having a traumatic brain injury that's going to basically sever the move from there to there but i think what's even more important is that there are people working on solutions for this kind of thing that yes is in als but is probably more commonly found in traumatic brain injuries and uh i mean i thought it was interesting that that uh you know we talked about we teased this last week that we were going to talk about uh, the Neuralink from Elon Musk. And literally, when I found the article, I was like, this is exactly it's it's TBI Awareness Month. But look at the, this is exactly what it seems he's working toward. Well, so in this 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 article that you mentioned, so this was a patient with ALS. Right. And just just quickly glancing at the article, it looks like they. Uh, because again, the brain was functioning, but right. his body wasn't. Was not. Mm-hmm. Uh, they used uh, a, a, what is called a brain machine interface. Mm-hmm. So a little microchip uh, that connected to his brain. Right. Uh, and they they used it uh, they, through, you know, a very complicated process that's not described in the article very in the the no, article not in this very well but article, it's, it's well. described in the scientific article very very well cool, cool, cool. um shout they, out to what was it nature which one is it this is in uh, uh nature communications yes yeah. which is part okay. of nature so so, so the they found a way so that the patient could communicate uh one letter at a time so it's right. a very slow and very tedious process yeah but because his brain was functioning, he could communicate one letter at a time, which is why, uh, so that he could provide some sort of communication. So yes, it is, it is sort of well. Yeah, yeah. Over over days, this guy sent a message that he he loves his son and he would like to have some beer. I thought that was wild. I mean, what are you doing? <laughs> that is that is it very German to say I would love some beer. <laughs> I'm laying here. I can't do anything, but beer would be nice (laughs) so yeah like I said I I was looking to see what is going on with Elon Musk's Neuralink and let me be sorry not not to interrupt you but there is a very famous um uh there's a famous book Mm -hmm. uh so I mean you don't people have uh, sometimes locked in patients can communicate they can their only uh motor ability is to move their uh eyes so so to close or open their eyes right so so they use that in order to communicate and uh the essentially you know if you show them the alphabet and you ask them are you thinking of letter A? And they'll say yes or no. They'll signal yes or no. Oh Are you thinking of the letter B? They'll signal yes or no. So, I mean, you can imagine how, how tedious of a process it is. Yeah. You, you are talking about 
ding, 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 the uncle on uh, uh, Breaking Bad. Do you remember that uncle? Have you seen? Have you seen Breaking Bad? Well, he had a stroke. He, he did, he was, but he, was, he wasn't really locked in. I was just saying, he, he, he's not using his brain to do it. He was actually using a finger, using a bell, and but bing, bing, bing every time that the guy would say, "Okay," the the nurse would say, "What row are we in? Row A. What line are we in? Are we going A, B, C?" D? And then it would, and it was yes, it was tedious. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very interesting that he he got it done you know so I mean? um again we're <laughs> we're, going, know, we're, we're, we're going off on different tangents but, but uh, Stephen, show, yes? Stephen Hawking yeah. uh used the, to do that too the That's famous right. physicist had ALS and he could only move uh, a finger and that's yeah. how he would communicate mm -hmm. um but there is a famous book uh called the diving bell and the butterfly oh yes i, I don't know if you're aware of it they, i've they, heard of this but i do not know exactly what it is about so go ahead. uh and that is uh, uh, uh in 95 uh, a french gentleman who was the editor-in-chief of the magazine l mm -hmm. uh he had a ex you know he had a stroke to the brain cell Mm -hmm. uh, and he was locked in Ooh. and he ended up despite the fact that he was locked in through this very tedious process that we described just by moving his eyes he wrote a book and it's called the diving bell and the butterfly and it's wow. a very very emotional book um about being trapped in his own brain and about appreciating life Okay. you know it's it's okay. uh, it's very highly recommended so okay very cool and very i mean cool. it, you just imagine that every word you're reading probably yeah. took a day to produce For, yeah how, how long is the book 150 200 pages maybe uh well, i'll tell you exactly i'll look it up i'll look it up it's, 100, mean, it's 131 pages so it's oh, not a long book it's not a any, long book but by any cool. means but i mean you know putting it in perspective it's yeah yeah i mean in, it's, incredible it's technically in his real it's that's war and peace in his for him to take so long to do it it's like it's like a huge book right yeah. um so yeah this thing is what you know could help someone with that condition i mean later on if, if you have als it probably would degenerate to the point where you can't assist someone but the point of um Elon Musk's Neuralink is to put this 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 that little thing that you just saw there inside the top of somebody's brain cutting it open putting that in there uh shunting these tiny little pieces of uh I guess wiring what do you what do you refer to that this is the the, the actual device right well keep going I want to I want to see like how you understand how much I understood okay so <laughs> I like that I like that yeah so like these little filaments that he is putting directly into the gray matter of the brain but not hitting veins or arteries that's what he said uh and then the signals from the brain would be going into that thing and then his idea is to implant a second device lower down into the body that receives information from the first device so that someone could actually uh, function after a tbi so if you had like a a neck injury and you're now a paraplegic or a a, a spine injury lower down and you're now a, a, a what is that if you're not a para then you're a, 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 a you know the word was just not you're you're paralyzed from the from the waist down then that's, that, that's paraplegic if you're paralyzed from the neck down it's called quadra quadra, quadra. that sorry my bad so the idea would be to put the thing right below wherever the break would be wherever the the disconnect is put the second one secondary one where the disconnect is and then in that way the 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 information that was coming from the brain now could 
get to the places where you know we'd snapped it and here's the robot and he's like literally showing you the robot that would implant this thing they're putting you out of a job doc what the heck <laughs> this robot that would cut the thing in your brain and then put it in and then do it but right now all he's got is um see those are the filaments like he's taking it and sticking it into the brain what do you think about that so that's my understanding of it that that's what he would use it to do but then there are other applications that we're talking about as well what do you think do you, do you like this do you like the idea of it so again we we kind of have to put this in perspective that's and, what i'm asking you for and, that. And, and you're gonna make me look like the bad guy again because why are you the bad guy <laughs> because it, it's such a it, it is a great idea yes it is uh you know it's, it's you're bringing science fiction into reality in a right. way um and i'll be the bad guy saying you know and the devil's advocate because we're still kind of a little bit far away from you know creating human cyborgs okay right. right i'm not saying it can never be done but but there's still a lot of hurdles and uh, elon musk is a visionary mm -hmm. and he pushes the brinks of science yeah. and technology and uh, uh which is great yeah um but he's not a neuroscientist or a neurosurgeon so right. th there are still a lot of challenges right so this goes back to the idea of machine um, brain interfaces right um and you know nerves use electricity mm -hmm. the neurons use electricity to transmit signals right and neurons are digital mm -hmm. so they either fire or don't fire and computers use microchips and transistors and logic gates and those are either you know open or closed so you know you have bytes it's either zero or one well i mean if you think about that you basically just said that they are very similar it's just that you would have to find the right neuron for the right switch to do this or that right and they'd so, all have to fire at once correct so the, so the mechanism mm -hmm. of uh on the, off off on right is uh you know it's competitive between yes. the 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 electronic world and the and the and the, and the neurons so people have always tried to find a way like can you pair these two together right so one way to do it is you gotta have like the an interface right uh, you know the neurons next to the the electrical machinery mm -hmm. and the electrical machinery takes the form of electrodes and an right. electrode is just a very 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 thin piece of wire mm -hmm. that's gonna sit next to the neuron and it will either transmit an electrical signal that will then get passed to the neurons or it will receive a signal passed from the neurons right so the challenge is you know neurons are very very small mm -hmm. and we have tons of them so one challenge is where do you put these electrodes right the other challenge is how many of these electrodes do you put in right so that becomes an engineering challenge as well yes because you need these electrodes to be very thin right you need them to somehow remain sterile because mm -hmm. any foreign object can cause an infection right and an infection in your brain can kill you that's a problem a infection anywhere can kill you but yeah. in your brain it's particularly bad right and you and you want a way to be able to uh, you know to increase your processing power and and that involves placing a lot of electrodes so well you, so you want to be able to communicate yeah with, with a lot of different neurons right 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 so, so that would be difficult yes over the past 20 years there's been research in brain machine interfaces mm -hmm. uh and you know to answer the question where do you put them right you gotta find an area in the brain that you can study uh and you you want to find an area on the surface of the brain because 
if you're putting them too deep in the brain, you can cause injury. Right. And you want a function to study a function that that is easy to track. So you can study if if you if you're starting if you want to build a brain machine interface to study happiness, it's going to be pretty difficult yeah. because what part of the brain makes you happy? I don't know if he's going for that though. No, he's no, no, no. I'm, I'm putting much more functional. Right. But I know, I know. Later on, we'll talk uh, about that. I'm putting, yes, I'm putting this in perspective. One of the applications was they wanted to to actually change people's mood. But I, right. I get, where, I know where you're coming from. I'm just so, saying so, this simple thing here right now that we're looking at on the screen right now is all they're doing is the pig has a snout. What are the messages that are coming from the snout as the pig touches the snout on the food or on the ground or that sort of thing? I see what you I understand what you're saying. So in the case of pigs, yeah. Um the pigs use their olfactory sense. The pigs mm -hmm. use the sense of smell in order to navigate around. Right. So a very very large part of the brain is devoted to smell yes uh more than dogs to be honest with you wow um in humans they picked movement because yeah. the motor cortex is we know where it is right. you can easily find it mm -hmm. it is on the surface of the brain so it's very accessible and it's something you can study because you either have movement or don't don't right so that's that's one area that's being looked at with neural link and then the biggest engineering uh, feat of Neuralink, what we know so far, because we know very little, mm -hmm. is that Elon Musk developed this process, this robot, this surgical robot that, that we saw, uh, that allows the implantation of hundreds of these electrodes. So it used to be that you could only implant 10 or 50 of these electrodes right. in one area. So you could interact only with very few neurons at a time. And if you interact with few motor neurons, you can only control very gross movement. Right. You cannot do fine motor movement like right. like type on a keyboard right. or, um, you know, open a door or button your shirt or anything right. like that. Right. You'd be able to lift your arm, but you wouldn't be able to play a piano or play. Exactly. Piano. Exactly. Exactly. But with his method, the, because a, a, a robot is implanting this electrodes, not a human being, these electrodes are tiny. They're thinner than human hair. Yeah. And he can put in hundreds of them. And so you can communicate with more motor neurons and then and subsequently, you can perform uh, finer motor tasks. Now, the question is, what's the point? Well, again, you're looking for patients with disconnect. Right. So you could have a spinal cord injury and you can't move your arms or legs. Or you could have a stroke and you can't move your arms or legs. Right. Um, how do you bypass the disconnect? So as, as long as your brain is functional as long as the motor cortex is functional uh this microchip and all these electrodes can read that part of the brain you can still be thinking that you want to move your arm right but if you have a disconnect you're not going to move your arm right nothing's going to happen so that thought is is read by this device right and then it becomes a digital signal and then that signal can be transmitted. And in the That's case, fine. again, of, of the neural link, it's transmitted via Bluetooth. So it's wireless, which is great. Yes. yes. Yeah. Now, but the other thing that he actually pointed out is you can run out of batteries. He literally says you have to charge this thing sure. at least every day, once a day. Sure. Yeah. Now, the, the other question is, what are you transmitting it to? Yes. Where are you sending the signal? Oh. Uh... And, you know, you could think of prosthetics. Yes. Um, you could think of, again, patients who are amputees, for example. Right. You can think of a prosthetic limb mm -hmm. that you can send that signal to. Right. And so patients, you know, they may not have great sensation, but they're able to move 
a fake arm or a fake leg. Um, again, going further into the future, you could think of a receiving device somewhere in the arm or leg that could communicate with the nerve so patients can use their own limbs. That's a little harder to do because once an, an extremity has been paralyzed, it's no longer the same. Those nerves are not the same. Those muscles are not the same. Those tendons yeah. are not the same. And so, that's what all these practical difficulties. Yeah, that's mean. what you're saying. That it, even though he might get the Neuralink to transmit, it may not receive the information that and and transmit it to the to the nerves that are actually broken down at the bottom. Right? In a way, they've been damaged. In, yeah. In terribly. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you have to think of where are you sending the signal. Now, yeah. there's a picture, there's a video of a monkey playing Pong. Yes. With, with Just by thinking about it. So in that case, the signal from the monkey's brain is being sent to a computer screen. Some, yeah, some sort of controller in the right. computer. Yeah, right. exactly. So, so that's the, mon different. the monkey is controlling the the graphics yes very simple well, graphics exactly with with with, simple. with its brain and, exactly. and, and, and that's fine yes good um but again when it comes to movement right you need to have probably very good prosthetics right right, right. but again it's 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 a very exciting technology but but what it boils down to is the yeah. ability to communicate with more neurons uh, safely because this this robot implants the electrodes in a way to avoid blood vessels uh, and that's really important so what do you think about so that's restoring mobility in limbs you think that it, it's, it's a possible but it's very very unlikely and or difficult it, we you don't think we have the technology to do it right now not right now i mean okay. 10 years from now maybe yeah. a different story maybe 20 years okay cool. um, but yeah like when when it comes to brain machine interfaces they serve two main functions and one is to restore function that has been lost mm -hmm. uh so you know in in the case of an injury or to enhance function that's there uh, and that's where you go into like science fiction cyborg territory right um because again that's where to enhance function meaning to enhance memory or to enhance uh vision or you know to directly communicate with uh, a machine by jacking into it like with a port like on the back the of your head. Doing. but do you, you yeah that like like ma matrix type you, stuff. well i don't know if we're gonna go matrix because we go to matrix the matrix is literally saying now i am moving a body well technically they weren't moving their bodies right they were laying down in a pod using their brain to basically do what the monkey was doing but on a much deeper level so instead of playing pong they were more like playing but, but think Halo. about it think about it yeah Just think about it so think of the matrix they're laying down yeah and they are uh you know which by the way that's a very you know it's been described like years before the matrix this whole idea of like immersing yourself in a virtual reality by having a plug in the back of your head you know like like William Gibson described this back in the late 70s, early 80s, you know. So anyhow. The book um, is based on simul the, the movie is based on simulacra simulacrum. If we want to go into that, we could that's a whole philosophical yeah, or, or the, I or think, no, therefore I am. The possibility no. is that we're not even really here. You and I are talking, but we're imagining all of this because our brains are actually sitting somewhere in a jar. And this is our consciousness doing this. It's not really, really happening. Yeah. So but that, I mean, again, we're gonna go off on, a, on another tangent. Here. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but but in the case of the Matrix, think about it. So you know, if you have a plug in the yeah. back of your neck, yeah, and you can connect to a machine mm -hmm. and see, smell, feel, taste, uh, hear things, right. Like you gotta have this this plug in the back of your head yeah. has to have connections with the entire brain. Yes. Um, 
I, I mean, like how, you know? <laughs> it's... Well, the, 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 that's the whole point. That's why it's science fiction, because there's a port going on here. But that means that if there's a port, that means it must have those filaments going throughout every single uh, neuron in the brain, which would be wild and crazy, just way too much. Yes? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So all the applications of the Neuralink, I mean, people were tossing them at him. And one of them was, of course, restoring mobility in the limbs. But then they were asking him, do you think... By, by the way, that's what the research is on. Yeah. And uh, they're in the process of trying to get FDA clearance for a human study. He, he got something. He got... Uh, what is it? He uh, a preferential something another, but he did not yeah. get the human study approved yet. But he says I'm working with the FDA. Yeah, but but but, but it is for uh, restoration of movement. Yeah. So so he's close, but he's not there. But then they asked him about saving memories, and he was like, "Yeah, I think that in the future we'll be able to save memories." What do you think? You think that that's possible? I mean, I think that's a pretty five. bold statement. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Memory is a very very poorly understood function yeah. yeah um we know how short-term memories are made right there is a process it has a name of long-term potentiation which is which happens in the hippocampus i mean basically it's a way that um neurons can change a certain uh, state of electrical activity and then come back to it mm -hmm. um, how that translates to visual auditory olfactory memories it's 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 hard to know plus memory there's not just one kind of memory uh, there is uh, there's memory of places memory of things that you know how to do what we call muscle memory uh, short-term memory, immediate recall, uh, and that's why when patients have Alzheimer's, which affects their memory, mm -hmm. they can remember things they did 20 years ago, but they don't remember what they had for lunch yeah. because different parts of memory get affected. Yeah. So we also don't know how memories are stored or where they're stored. Right. You know, we know that if you have an injury to the hippocampus on both sides, which is part of your temporal lobe. We know you cannot make new memories, but you can still remember old stuff. Yeah. So long-term memories are stored. The thinking is that they're kind of stored all over okay. the brain. Um, so how will you, you know, you need to identify you, you need to learn more about this process right. in order to go in and interfere with it and, and store and memories. Right. Yeah. I would think I mean, that you it, have to have something plugged into every sensory field of the body. Because when you have, when you're making a memory, like we're talking now and, and later on tonight, I'll be thinking about this and thinking about uh, the temperature or what it smells like in this room or what I saw when I'm looking at you, all those things, th those things would all have to be plugged into to memorize or to remember anything. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not feasible. Yeah. yeah that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying that it seems to be way more than you could possibly do. All right. So, so you don't think memories, what about blindness? He says he, he, he thinks that, yeah, it, it's a possibility to cure, cure blindness. I mean, that's a lot. So, uh, with blindness, mm -hmm. you have a disconnect. Mm -hmm. You have a disconnect between the eye and the, and the visual cortex of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, and depending, and again, blindness, there's different types of blindness. You can have blindness because there's something wrong with the eye. Right. Or you can have blindness that comes from a stroke because there's something wrong with the visual cortex. Um, in the case where blindness is the result of a problem with the eye, but the visual cortex is functioning, you can conceive of uh, a setup where you have this, you know, this microchip on the visual cortex and it communicates with thousands of neurons in the uh, visual cortex 
and then it receives signals from an artificial eye right um so so that i can see okay. um that's a simpler thing again i can't tell you in how many years yeah but but, it's, but, but that's a more realistic um yeah scenario than, application mm -hmm. that, than the memory yeah so then they were talking about treating mental health conditions and we already talked about that how that would be almost impossible like depression anxiety and addiction. i don't i don't i don't want to say impossible okay yeah. you know because you know <laughs> next thing you know they do it and you're like oh. because a hundred years from now someone may be watching this video and laugh yeah, like, <laughs> these guys were dumb <laughs> <laughs> but but that's 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 incredibly difficult because again these are processes we don't understand yeah. very well right. and then and then think of the there's a lot of social implications too right i mean if if you look at the history of medicine is filled with crazy things mm. people used to do especially when it comes to psychiatric conditions yeah um I have a book called Quackery. <laughs> you would have that book, yeah. And 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 it's it, it it's filled with like anecdotes of the crazy things people used to do to treat psychiatric diseases. Yeah. In fact, we should have an episode just on that. Just on that. Let's you will be amazed. Really? Yes. I don't think so. An episode, an episode on quackery. Quackery. So we're gonna we're gonna lock that in and make sure that we do that this season. Quackery. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 there's also a social uh, stigma, right? I mean, people used to do frontal lobotomies to treat psychiatric conditions, and sometimes and, not even psychiatric conditions. And the guy got a, a Nobel of Medicine for it for doing it. And you're saying psychiatric conditions, but literally there were behavioral things that they would do for that. Like say a woman had a very strong libido and they didn't like the fact that she had a strong libido. There were people who were put in hospitals and given shock therapy because they like to have more sex than was supposedly you're, allowed. You're that, that, is, that is the condition of hysteria. <laughs> hysteria hysteria that's what they yeah. used to call it in yeah. the, back in in victorian uh, era in the early 1900s and right. again that, that that's also part of quackery yes but i'm just saying does that mean every woman nowadays is in hysteria uh and please please don't cancel us for me saying that i'm just saying it's <laughs> there are um... tons of people who have healthy libidos but back in the 1800s would have been seen as deviants and uh, psycho psychologically, you know, something is wrong with them, right? I think you can you can conceive of a device mm -hmm. that communicates with areas of the brain to cause, to mimic uh, and induce emotions. That I can see. Mm -hmm. Um and and obviously that has the potential to be abused right yeah i mean that that's what that's what recreational drugs do they, uh, yeah they trigger different things they, in the they, brain yeah they, they trigger chemical release in the brain that causes you know different states of right. consciousness right. euphoria right um you know you think that it gives you more energy etc right right uh so you know uh, uh, this device could be used for in a similar purpose yeah but again be... also it's it's hard to know what's considered normal and and you're kind of this is a slippery slope it is it is and if you think about it you're 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 saying to yourself okay this person has depression they shouldn't have depression because their life is xyz but if you think about it and you're like okay you know i've, I've heard people talk about certain people certain famous people and they're like why is that person depressed or what are, you don't know what that person was going through and the body and the mind was probably doing exactly what it needed to do to make that person feel bad so that they moved out of whatever that situation was 
so that they no longer feel bad. So you're very, you're right. It's it's very very subjective. It's very difficult to say this should be that or that should be this way. Uh, what about um, connecting a heads up display so you could receive information about things that you're looking at, like in the Terminator when he's like you know looking up and he sees sees things. I mean, couldn't we do that with like Google Glass or something like that? Why would we need to have a uh, 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 Neuralink for that. Well, this talks about a Google Glass kind of on the, on the inside. Yes, uh, yes, no, yes. So it would be inside. Uh, well. Again, I, I don't know. I think uh, I, I don't see that happening very soon. And I think it could also drive you crazy. I mean, that, that, <laughs> that would be like having a cell phone screen yeah. in the back of your eye. And would you be able to turn it off though? I, would you I be able to that, turn it off? Yeah, I figure you'd be able to turn it off. Like if you can have it, then you should be able to at some point turn I it off. I think we're gonna see more evolution of augmented reality yeah. pick, picking up this task right, right, right. than uh, so yes, Google Glass type devices, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe even um, a lens, an eye lens uh, right. that gives you that option. Um, something you can wear uh, something wearable uh, before we see what yeah I, 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 I don't I don't think that's a very realistic uh, last one I'm gonna ask you the last one if you think I could get a neuralink and you could get a neuralink implanted by the robot and then we could do this entire podcast via telepathy. So I'd be talking to you, you're talking to me, but it's all on the screen. We're not even saying a word, just. If that's not too unrealistic. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's possible. Uh, <laughs> that's possible, <laughs> okay. <laughs> if the Neuralink is connected to the speech area. Right. Uh, and there is a way that you can pair the devices. Right. Um, it's Bluetooth. It can be paired. I mean, you would need, first off, you would need a way just, just like the ALS patient, but, but a much, much more streamlined way yeah. of translating your thoughts into words. Yeah. Not just letters, one letter at yeah, a time. Exactly. So you would need a Neuralink that, you know, when, when you're thinking of saying a word, yeah, your, your brain has a specific firing pattern. So you will need a neural link that reads that, translates it into words without making errors. Because, right. you know, if you think texting is resulting <laughs> in some funny messages, I'm sure telepathy will be worse. Sorry, I butt dialed you. I said duck instead of what I wanted to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that autocorrect would be mad crazy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, you know, maybe, who knows? Yeah, yeah. You think that that one's possible. All right, all right, all right. Well, as usual, it was excellent talking to you. Yo, we went to, we went a full hour tonight like it was completely different but we had a great topic i feel like uh more people would like to know about uh a, a neurosurgeon's opinion of exactly what happened what could happen with with a device like that and what do you think he's he's gonna put you out of um out of a job soon with this robot no. here that he's got no <laughs> no <laughs> no you need someone who's gonna run the robot Right, that's the thing. Like the robot has to say, "Okay, I, I, I know what this, this, what should be done, or what this person's brain should look like, and then fix it." But you know that requires a human, like, like you know, diagnostically, right? Right. Right. Cool. Cool. So, listen, Doc. It's great to talk to you. Uh, next time, like next time. Yeah, as always, I will. Let's. Uh, uh, let's talk soon and uh, talk about some more ideas about the brain, about uh, neurosurgery and neuroscience. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening to The Brainstorm with Simon Amisius and host Ryan Williams. Didn't like that, huh? <laughs> I got to fix that. I got to fix that. You got to make the letters bigger. <laughs> I got to make the letters bigger. Okay, so one last time for... Um, <laughs> for 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 good measure all right, all right.